Take a seat. Gosh, that stopped everybody talking. Welcome, everybody, to Design Revolutions. This is the first inaugural lecture um, that Enid and Lester Morse um, have um, sponsored for us for this historic design lecture series. It's a great thrill for us to be here at the uh, University Club as well, particularly as we're halfway through the renovation program at the museum. So we've just been able to move into our townhouses and our new Newark facility, but we're just about to close the mansion for a couple of years to expand the exhibition space and renovate it. Um, so it's just wonderful to have the sort of partnership with other locations like here at the University Club to continue our programs. Um, and this is the series that will really allow people to see what we've got in our collections. You know, we have 250,000 items in the collections, and it's just wonderful to have an opportunity to bring some of them to the fore and make them more visible. And so um, we have to thank Denny and Lester Morse for their vision in helping us create this initiative, which really highlights the historic uh, collections that we have at different periods of time. We also would like to thank the members of the advisory committee, which includes Marilyn Friedman, who's here tonight, Sarah Lawrence, Nancy Marks, Esme Uzdan, um, as well as our curators for helping us decide what to focus on and how to do it. Um, and for those of you who um, also like to see a different kind of show, I hope you'll visit our exhibition at the United Nations, which opened a couple of weeks ago and is open until January the 9th. And that's about the design with the other 90% cities. It's about a, a very different world, really, from the University Club, but a very fascinating show. Um, and so now, please uh, welcome um, uh, Caroline Bowman, our Associate Director, who's going to introduce our guest, Dr. Penny. Good evening, everybody. It is a thrill to see the house absolutely full tonight. It really is just wonderful. We are taking the opportunity of the museum's renovation to pepper the city with Cooper Hewitt programs, whether it be education events like tonight or exhibitions like the one that we just opened to the UN, at the UN. Dinny and Lester, we couldn't have done this without you. So thank you so much. It was extremely thoughtful, very generous, very early in the game. Um, in our planning period, Dinny came to us and said, I want to do something, I want to do a lecture series, and it's just really, really terrific to be able to do this, show off our collection, and keep you all involved in these two years. We're not even using the verb to close. We're trying to think about the Cooper Hewitt being open, but in different locations across the city and across the nation. The next lecture in this series will be April 24th, when Dr. Carolyn Sargentson presents False Bottoms and Secret Compartments, Locking Away the Secrets of Ancien Regime Paris. So please mark your calendars now so that you don't miss that one. And the final event will coincide with the reopening of the museum in 2013. I'm absolutely delighted to present our first speaker in the series, Dr. Nicholas Penny, director of the National Gallery of Art in London. And I know that he has a stopwatch, which is part of the reason I'm speaking quickly, because he has the whole thing timed like to a Swiss watch. Uh, after obtaining a doctorate from the Courtauld, Dr. Penny began his career as a lecturer in art history at the University of Manchester. His very first museum position was that of keeper of the Department of Western Art at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. From 1990 to 2000, Dr. Penny was the core curator of Renaissance painting at the National Gallery in London. His American colleagues were thrilled when he was made the Andrew W. Mellon Professor at the Center for Advanced Studies in the Visual Arts in, in the year 2000. And then from 2002 to 2008, he was the senior curator of sculpture and decorative arts at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, before returning to Trafalgar Square. Dr. Penny is the author of numerous books and articles on both painting and sculpture, and on the history of collecting and taste. His works include scholarly catalogs, introductory texts for students, and critical re reviews for the general reader. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nicholas Penny. Thank you very much. Almost all of it, in fact, all the facts completely correct. 
And the, could I have the lights? Uh, down, not on, or off. I'd like to thank May Ma for having the courage to um, invite me to give this lecture, uh, and Jackie Killian in the print room for um, making it possible for me to see so many of the wonderful drawings. When you see drawings tonight, they'll, I think every single one of them will be in the Cooper Hewitt collection. When you see paintings, they'll usually be in the National Gallery, unless the slide is very bad, in which case it's a photograph taken by me elsewhere. The moment that I was called to give this lecture or invited to give this lecture, I was um, pondering the problem of marriage portraits, double portraits, or rather paired portraits, pendant portraits of a man and a woman. And here's one of the earliest that I know. It's in the National Gallery in London by Robert Campin. And this is a fascinating pair of people. You could believe that they were looking at each other, although I doubt that that was intended, because the lighting in the pictures is so different. They make a very fascinating contrast, but not, I think, they are not calculated as a single composition, one carefully related to another. Go forward 70 years, and you find Raphael painting this remarkable pair of portraits in Florence. Um, the gentleman on the left <coughs> must certainly have always been in that position. That's the correct position for a man. For a husband, it's the more important position, and uh, it was the heraldic position as well. And these paintings are clearly intended to hang together. There's a more or less continuous landscape and skyscape between them. And I believe that possibly Madalena Doni, the lady, uh, was painted first and was conceived of, clearly the composition is derived from the Mona Lisa by Raphael, as an independent uh, picture. But certainly her husband... Um, is a picture, this is a picture which is really, um, doesn't really make sense without its companion. So this is a real, these are real companion pictures and among the earliest that we know, and not only that, but they clearly were intended to hang side by side. Go forward, um, forward 15, 20 years, um, 20 years to this great pair of portraits by Heemskirk, a different type of people. They are actually doing things, not just displaying uh, their rings, but doing things with their hands. And if they hang next to each other, they, make, they can only be arranged like this, which requires a special explanation, which is provided by the label in the museum in Rotterdam, in which they hang today, which explains that perhaps they were only engaged which I think is unlikely because I don't think you take to um, that particular type of um, domestic activity <clears throat> at that preliminary stage. Um, and in fact, there is another explanation of the arrangement of these pictures, which is that it's wrong. Uh, because the lighting to which we now are so insensitive, because we have artificial light, the lighting is different in both pictures. She is lit from one side, he is lit from the other, and there are very few rooms in which you can hang pictures in that way which would have had that lighting. So these pictures were more likely either have hung in different rooms or, what I think is a much better idea, they hung opposite each other. That, in fact, is very commonly the case with European portraits. And in the same museum in Rotterdam, you can see a pair of oval portraits, or maybe they're round, I'm not quite sure, um, from where I'm standing, and uh, they're lit from opposite sides, and they don't look at each other unless they're opposite each other. And the same applies to this gentleman and his wife and son or daughter, painted at the beginning and at the end of the 17th century. And although we are familiar today with the bizarre phenomenon that you see in these pictures of a man with his shadow to his uh, right and the lady with her shadow to her left, because... We see people so often, and we see pictures even more often, by spotlight. That would have been regarded as a completely ridiculous arrangement in the 16th century when Cranach the Younger painted these pictures. So they too must surely have been either hanging in different rooms or hanging opposite each other. 
And I think that remains true right into the 19th century, into the 1820s, when Ang painted the great portraits that are now in the Metropolitan Museum. Because interesting though it is to compare these pictures, looking at side by side, the absolute lack of psychological relationship between them when they're in that arrangement, and something always to me felt wrong about it. And then of course, checking the lighting, the lighting is inconceivable for paintings side by side. So the Le Grandins also had their paintings planned to be, I think, opposite each other. And why do art historians not realize this, or very seldom realize it? Because you can't show it effectively in a book, and you can't show it effectively in a slide lecture, unless I projected something on the back and you all had swiveling seats. And you, uh, and you can, um, not only that, but you can hardly find a museum in the world where it's possible to arrange portraits effectively in this way. But in domestic interiors, it's actually quite common. But unfortunately, I have no representation of a domestic interior which actually shows two portraits in this way because the artists who depict interiors are also restricted. They tend not to um, show, uh, um, uh, as, as you might in a film, the entire room. This is rather on my mind because um, this picture is rather on my mind. The National Gallery acquired it together with the National Gallery of Scotland. It's Titian's great painting of Diana surprised by Actian. And we hope soon to acquire its pendant, uh, Callisto, Diana and Callisto. And uh, this great pair of pictures was sent by Titian as a pair of pictures to Philip II in Spain. And we don't know how originally they were arranged. But the lighting, the lighting is from different directions. The light falls on the ferocious, surprised Diana on the right of the picture here. And on the other one, it falls on her neck and her face, her <coughs> cruel, uh, vengeful face is in shadow. Um, so, in all likelihood, these paintings were made to hang opposite each other. It's exactly what we can only do with great difficulty today, whether in the National Gallery of Scotland or the National Gallery in London. Uh, and that Titian did, in fact, plan pairs of pictures in this way is clear from the only letter of his which sheds any light on how his paintings sent um, so far across Europe from Venice to Madrid were actually planned to be arranged because he speaks of another pair of pictures as being so interesting that you can see a nude figure from behind in one of them and from in front in the other and that you, the implication is that you turn from one to the other. So that, I'm sure, was the way in which they were arranged, which is a bit of a headache for me. You may say that these paintings sent um, from far away to another court um, how can the artist have really known the place in which they were to be, in which they were, uh, to be put? Were they really artists who were place, painting for places? I think they probably were, that they were probably given pretty precise instructions, and that would apply to a picture like Bronzino's Allegory in the National Gallery, which we know was sent from Florence to the French court to delight Francis I. I think Bronzino knew not only what the king, uh, sort of thing, the king liked, um, but also um, he was probably told exactly the size that it should be. There are paintings in the 18th century which were painted primarily for exhibition uh, by the leading artists who actually hoped to achieve their reputation to maintain their fame as painters by exhibiting sensationally um, attractive pictures at the Royal Academy. And there's very good reason to suspect that Reynolds' portrait of Captain Orme, which you see on the left, and of uh, General Tarleton, no friend to uh, <coughs> the American colony, um, both of which are in the National Gallery, and it seems likely that both of those were painted really. They were Reynolds' idea to paint them. They weren't properly commissioned, and the idea was that they would create a sensation at the Royal Academy. And that continues to be the case with in the 19th century when there are great pictures painted primarily for their effect at the Academy in London or the Salon in Paris. And Delaroche's great picture of the execution of Lady Jane Grey is a case in point. But even here, this is a picture, and so too uh, were the Reynoldses. This is the picture which was painted for a particular place because at these crowded uh, great annual or biannual exhibitions, uh, the large paintings 
um, were hung above the line. That was quite high, higher than you will ever see them hung in galleries today. And indeed, we had an exhibition quite recently in the National Gallery devoted to uh, Delaroche, and it was only when the exhibition was over that I realized that the only really effective way of displaying this painting is to have it far higher than we can show it anywhere in the National Gallery, the height at which it would have been shown in the Paris Salon. Because the whole point is that she's on a scaffold, which is uh, the same root as scaffolding, that's to say raised up above the crowd which was to witness her execution. And you can see the staircase running, rushing down behind um, the platform where she is to be executed. So seen from that position, and you have to sort of lie on the floor in the National Gallery to get this idea, that head, that beautiful head, um, will fall in front of you and the horror of this picture will be enormously enhanced. Well, that's the point at which I'd reached, more or less, when uh, the idea that I give this lecture was mooted. And I thought, well, let's go back, because I'm now responsible for paintings that cover five centuries in the National Gallery, and I like to try and um, take an aerial view. I thought, let's go back and see where, what the ev evidence is for where pictures in particular rooms may really have been displayed. And the earliest painting we have in the National Gallery in London, which gives you any idea at all, is this predella panel by Giovanni Di Paolo, showing the birth of the Baptist. And it's interesting because the bed has got paintings on it. And we do know that that was a prime position for panel paintings in the 15th and actually also in the 16th century. We have a painting in the National Gallery which we know for certain. It's painted by uh, Montaigne and a companion picture by Bellini's in the National Gallery of Art in Washington. We know that this painting was made for a frieze quite high in a room, not necessarily a very large room. You can see that the vanishing point, where you see any bits of architecture, perhaps most clear on the steps on the far right, is actually way below the painting itself. And actually, you can just see on the far right of this picture um, a sort of sliced triangle. And I think that must have been caused by the fact that it was high in the room and the, um, the projecting chimney breast would have been like the one that you see here, which is quite standard in Italian houses, and that would have cut into the frieze around the top of the room. So this is an unusual picture because we know that it was painted for a certain place in a room, and it's not so rare, as we'll see, to have paintings designed for very high up in a room. And then we have these paintings, these long paintings, one by Bacchiacca, uh, one of two by Bacchiacca, in fact, and one below it by the greater artist, Pontormo, made in the second decade of the 16th century for uh, one of the most famous rooms in Florence, the Borgherini bedchamber. And these pictures would certainly have been incorporated into the paneling of a bed, uh, although we don't know exactly where, probably into the sides of the chests that were placed around beds at that date. So these are kind of chest paintings. We're more familiar to, with that type of painting in Florence, but... Um, in, this, in the 15th century. These, in fact, are some of the last really famous pictures of this kind painted in Florence. I think they were replaced in popularity by wood carvings thereafter. And this picture, um, which is the only painting ob almost certainly designed for an ecclesiastical setting that I'm showing in this lecture by Giovanni Bellini, I'm showing you because no one would have suspected that it was a cupboard door actually a door for a sacramental tabernacle had it not been that a keyhole turned up in the x-ray uh, of it when that was made um, three or four decades ago. And I think that uh, doors or uh, shutters of one sort or another are quite an important type of picture. We have two beautiful examples from around 1500 by Mantegna in the National Gallery. And you can see, I think, that uh, these pictures, if they were on shutters, which for various reasons I think is very likely, what type of shutter I don't know, but maybe even the um, shutters of a window, uh, one was to be placed very much below another. The one on the left of the Vestal Virgin uh, Tuccia, you can see that the viewing point is, uh, is much higher than in the other, as you can see from the amount of ground visible around the feet. And then we have this painting here, which is sometime by Filippo Lippi from the middle of the 15th century. And its opinion is divided as to whether this picture is a bedhead or is um, 
a overdoor. Uh, there are very good objections to both theories, but they are the most likely place, places that this picture would originally have been painted for. The objection to it being an overdoor is that it has such exquisite detail that would certainly have been invisible from that point, but that applies to many other works of art that were placed in very high loca uh, locations. Um, the objection to the headboard of a bed must be that actually they were tend they usually rectangular, although there are, I think, there is one surviving example of this shape at that date. Um, and also, you must imagine that um, it would have got more damaged. Um, then I'm showing you this one religious image of a kind that exists very, well, probably one of the most popular types of painting of the Virgin of Child, which were painted for people's bedchambers in the 15th century and in the early 16th. And we know from all the evidence points to them being displayed far higher than we would think appropriate today. You'll notice, though, that there isn't, in fact, a low viewing point on the, uh, the, the, the ledge in front of the Virgin. Nevertheless, uh, this is also the case with paintings which we know were placed high above altarpieces. This type of rule, the rule that was obeyed by Montaigne in his frieze, was not invariably adhered to um, by, uh, by painters um, in this period. So, uh, but what makes this very significant, the, the high placing in the room, is the actual way that the Virgin, or sometimes the child, or sometimes both, actually looked down at the beholder. And that, I think, was, um, uh, is, a, is, a, is a way in which these pictures are diminished when they're um, shown in museums today. Um, although the other thing that, of course, is very odd is that they tend to have another version of child and another version of child and another version of child and another version of child next to them, which would never have been the case, and slightly reduces their impact as religious images. Um, in the 16th century, Many of these paintings of the Virgin and Child, sometimes with saints, um, which uh, survive, do quite clearly uh, take into account, both from their handling and from the positions of the figures, the fact that they were um, to be intended to be shown high in a room. And here, in fact, is a fresco by uh, Veronese, um, which accords quite closely to uh, a uh, canvas painting by him, which would also have been intended to show at the same height but of which I do not, as it happens, have a slide. And then there's this category, another category, of ceiling painting, of which it is rather unusual to find examples before the end of the 16th century, of which this is an example, um, which are now to be found in, in art galleries because they were so much more frequently painted in fresco than on canvas. But this painting by uh, Damiano Mazza, a follower of Titian, um, is a very good example of a ceiling painting converted in format to something more appropriate for a gallery. But in fact, as you can see from this slide, it's been extended on all sides. It originally would have been this shape. And this is a very good shape for uh, a ceiling painting because it makes you aware of the fact that the picture can be seen from more than one point of view, which is, of course, uh, a very um, important for the impact of a picture like this in a room in which people are moving around. Now we get to something from the Cooper Hewitt's collection, this superb um, uh, bozzetto for a, a ceiling picture um, uh, by Maisonnier to, uh, to be painted, exhibited in Paris, but sh um, made for Prime Minister of Poland. And in this picture, you can see the shape of the ceiling pictures uh, developing in a very interesting way because it's most of the painting after the rounded rectangle of the frame. The painting then is a fictive extension of a room showing uh, arched pendentives going on to uh, a, a sort of very um, beautiful, uh, continuously curved and cusped shape above which there is, you can just see, the rim of a fictive dome now blasted with light by Apollo in his chariot, who is hardly visible at all, so light is he. And um, this shape, uh, which is a, a sort of transitional shape between the rectangle and the shape of the dome, becomes the characteristic shape of much ceiling painting later in the 18th century. For example, the ceiling painting made by Tiepolo, which is one of the most beautiful pictures in the National Gallery in London. There's now none of the... This is... Um, 
these, uh, this wonderful cusped oval um, has no pretext in illusionist architecture, but it was the preferred shape, or a preferred shape, for just the stucco um, compartment of a ceiling. And when we look at this picture by Tiepolo, of course, we, uh, it's marvelous to find uh, how carefully the composition relates to the little cusps, which top right lead you down the diagonal of those ladies' arms, or in the lower right um, seems perfectly positioned for um, another uh, diagonal in the picture, and then you find the little foot lower left so carefully related to that other cusp. And generally, the pattern of this composition seems to spring from the shape of the picture, but of course, the shape of the picture was determined by the stucco on the ceiling, and the stucco on the ceiling was designed by an architect and not by Tiepolo. And in fact, when one sees other paintings in situ in Venice with the stucco of the ceiling, you see how much the actual palette of the artist was determined by, in fact, the color scheme um, used in, these, um, uh, in, in this uh, particular setting. And the stunning uh, effect of orangey-yellow behind uh, Venus, as well as the pink, the very pale pink, uh, and of course a very pale blue, would have found some echo, as would the greeny blue of the globe of the Earth, which you can just see at the bottom of this picture, found some echo in the colors of the ceiling decoration. So when Tiepolo was commissioned to paint what is perhaps his most famous uh, decorative scheme, that of uh, the story of Antony and Cleopatra for Palazzo Labia in Venice in the, in the um, 1750s, he knew more or less how he was going to treat the subject, and you can see, because he had painted it before, and you can see this bozzetto in the National Gallery for uh, this great uh, and splendid episode in which uh, the Cleopatra drops a priceless pearl into what must have been a very vinegary glass of wine in order to um, show how indifferent she was to uh, the, um, the price of... Uh, what she consumed. Um, that could be better put. But the way this scene was condensed using some of the motifs in Palazzo Labia in this fresco was actually determined by the real architecture of the room, which I'm showing you on the right of this slide, the architecture of um, Massari, a very great uh, Venetian architect. And you can see how Tiepolo has picked up the pattern of this balustrade in his painting, and not only that, but actually the color of the stone, the, the um, Verona marble of pale, very, very pale orangey yellow, and even the frieze of greeny marble, Verde Antico, um, from uh, Massari's architectural arrangements. And throughout this room, the entire color scheme is determined by the marble, the real marble that's used by Massari, is then the color that is imitated in the frescoes, and then everything else follows from that. So even if we think Tiepolo is a much greater artist than the architect, the architect and the room came first. And here I'm showing you one of the most important drawings in the Cooper Hewitt. Um, it's a drawing by the great architect Oppenor for one of the most spectacular rooms um, in the Palais Royal, the residence of the Regent of France, to whom he was appointed architect in 1715. Um, Oppenor designed this with a great deal of um, sculpture that he intended, both freestanding and relief, to be appropriate ornaments of his architecture. But, in fact, this room and all the rooms that he designed in the Palais Royal were eventually filled with uh, paintings. He didn't especially like that idea, but I'm showing you this um, to show you that, because it, I wish to introduce again into this talk the subject of the overdoor. And you can see that there are two types of overdoor in this picture. The rectangles of the doors to left and right, and their angles, which gave this room its name. Um, these doors are within, uh, have 
um, lunettes on top of them, and within those lunettes, ovals, which would have been in relief. And then above the cornice, there are large sculptural groups. The use of sculpture above a door was quite a common feature throughout the 18th century, and there are no doubt many examples earlier. Well, many examples. In, that, in this case, you actually see from Marchione's designs for the Villa Albani in Rome, you actually see that antique sculpture has been incorporated above the door. So very prized possessions of this kind could be incorporated in this place. And you actually see the same thing being done at, uh, by Frederick the Great at Sans Souci. You'll see this is a slice taken from the front of an ancient sarcophagus incorporated above the door, above the overdoor, above the door. So it's an over-overdoor um, in his great picture gallery at Potsdam. Um, now these, as a position for sculpture, the other place for a relief might be above a chimney piece. And in 18th century decoration, the chimney piece and the overdoor have a very interesting relationship. One is a small opening with a large ornamental area above it, and the other is uh, reverse. We'll meet this, uh, this work again later. It um, corresponds incidentally um, with the great uh, admiration for this particular sculpture, this relief of Antinous, which quite suddenly became one of the most famous works of art in the world. And those of you who, um, when you're next in the Metropolitan Museum, uh, you should have a look very carefully at this spectacular uh, full-length portrait by Pompeo Batoni, because if you look at it in a raking light, you'll see that the relief of Antinous appears to have been uh, cut out and inserted, and I don't think it's compositionally very, very felicitous, but I do think that the patron said he must have that in the picture. This is merely uh, a footnote to this lecture. Um, why the, <coughs> the, was the overdoor such an important thing for architects? Because the rooms, um, being uh, horizontal, as uh, rectangular or largely rectangular, um, could best be uh, defined or, and contrasted with uh, vertical uh, elements. And a door was not really properly tied to the cornice of the room unless it was extended upwards. That basically is all that's happening here. You'll see in this beautiful drawing by Taraval that he's placed reliefs above the door to bring the door up to the height of uh, the cornice, but also, and more particularly, up to the height of the looking glass above the chimney piece. So something that happened in the uh, 18th century was that looking glass was used more and more, glass, mirror glass is used more and more in interiors. And it's used to relate to um, the actual size of windows, and actually often to multiply the light coming in from those windows. So you have actually uh, these three uh, important verticals in the design of a room, the mirror, the doors, and the windows. This may sound staggeringly obvious, but actually it had played relatively little part in the really beautiful um, in interiors uh, created um, in earlier centuries, and especially um, in Italy, where windows don't have to be so large. And it remains a very important feature of rooms throughout the 19th century. And I'm showing you now um, one of the really beautiful watercolor inter interiors in the... Um, in the Thor gift to the Cooper Hewitt. This is a really beautiful um, design of an interior in France, I think, in the 1820s. And you can see that the door has been raised up with a relief or a fictive relief above it to match that above the looking glass, which is above the chimney on the right-hand side of the image. And then you can see its relationship also with the windows on the other side. We'll come back, perhaps, to the paintings in this room later. And here is a drawing room in England at Cashbury, um, in which show you the same feature, the Grinling Gibbons type decoration which had been adapted for the overdoor, which also has a relief in it, and for the chimney piece. Now all of these overdoors uh, and the chimneys that I've been showing you so far, these are sculptural, but the whole thing can go into reverse, and as you'll see from this very pretty little picture by Devis, which is, I see, recently come on loan at the Metropolitan Museum, you'll see that the overdoor and the 
overmantel or the chimney painting are both paintings rather than sculpture, and a little bit of sculpture is consigned elsewhere. These interiors are very spare, but there are, there certainly was the way in which many interiors in, in Britain and actually in the Low Countries and sometimes also in France were arranged in the early decades of the 18th century. And in fact, even in relatively modest in, or indeed poor interiors, paintings, if there were paintings there, were very frequently placed above doors. Um, not, I think, in this case for any particularly architectural reason, but just because they seemed, it seemed to be the right place for them. And this is the last episode, a rather dismal episode, um, tragic episode, in a Hogarth's marriage a la mode um, on, the, on the right, and a detail from a picture of a poor, uh, a relatively poor artist's uh, home by a Dutch painter of around 1790 on the other side. Of course, overdoors could be very lavish in very, very rich interiors. And here you see a particularly magnificent early 18th century t interior, and you see the overdoor, and then you see the overdoor repeated um, uh, uh, in shape above uh, a panel to the left of the chimney. Again, a, the, 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 ch the chimney piece is completed with a mirror. Um, and you'll s these pieces are shaped as well. And of course, it's very characteristic of decoration in the early 18th century that the paintings will follow quite elaborate shapes m made f um, by uh, other, um, by, by the by the decoration around them, and very rarely are these rectangular. The subjects are amorous ones, and this is, in fact, a bedchamber. And it's interesting that you find the same sort of subject, um, albeit one lascivious subject from the Old Testament and another recognizable, actually, as a Correggio, um, in this, again, in Hogarth's series of interiors. These, of course, are not overdoors, but it's interesting that they are more or less at the height, or very, very much higher in the room than we would expect to find them today. The overdoor is of enormous importance for the history of sculpture. Here you see two busts in hollows above doors. This is an English interior of about 1770, and, but I think it's true that over half the, the bust sculpture made between 1500 and, uh, and 1700 and at a very great many, at a later date, were actually designed for this position, which was a position of honor, although not one in which we would ever wish to see a very fine marble bust today. And uh, you have also many paintings which pretend to be sculpture, which are fictive sculpture, definitely designed for this position. There are, there are a pair of them in the Metropolitan, and here's one of them by Tiepolo. And then you sometimes have overdoors which are both um, sculptural and paintings. There's a marvelous drawing in the Duke of Hewitt for a um, rich plasterwork trophy frame, which I'm sure is for an overdoor by Francesco de Mura. And there you see in the Fitzwilliam Museum on the left the type of painting, actually more or less the same pose, that he um, would have placed in that frame which he himself has designed. I said that these overdoors are, in the 18th century, relatively rarely rectangular. That's an exaggeration. Here is a case of really important princely bedroom where they are planned. The spaces are clearly there for rectangular pictures. And here is the interior of Palazzo Pisani Moretta as it was designed or modified in the 1770s. This was the room in the palace on the Grand Canal in which Veronese's great painting of the family of Darius uh, was hung, and what you see here is a copy which remains in this palace of that great painting. What you see also, unfortunately, is this mad 20th century habit of giving ceilings separate lighting, which completely destroys the unity of a room, and, um, but you see it everywhere. Um, but you also see portraits and, as overdoors, and this was a very common place for painted portraits. These are of an unusual horizontal format, but there are many cases where they were of a portrait format, as we call it. I think this 
um, great painting of Daniele Barbaro, which is on loan to the National Gallery in London at the moment from the Rijks Museum, is an example of an overdoor portrait. Um, and I think this is so probably chiefly because, the, again, the, the vanishing point is uh, deliberately placed way below the painting, which would not have been ca the case had it been hung as we would naturally hang it today. And another reason for suspecting that this picture was made for a particular place is the fact that the lighting comes from the right, which would never be a right-handed artist's choice. But in those days, paintings were painted for the lighting in particular rooms. I even think it's possible that Titian's great portrait, now known as the Schiavona, was originally an overdoor. Um, although I would never wish to place it in that position. But it is curious in inventories how often, uh, although I haven't found one quite so early as this, the great uh, major portraits are shown in this position. But overdoors can be almost any subject. The uh, beautiful still life drawings by Udry in uh, the Cooper Hewitt collection, for example, I think are very likely to have been over. And most surprisingly of all, sometimes really elaborate flower paintings were placed in that position. That was clearly so with this picture by Jan van Huysum, painted in the middle of the 18th century. Um, it's one of those still lives which looks, looks rather weird because the greens are turning blue. But it is also one of those pictures where you expect to admire the precise pick painting of caterpillars and butterflies and the like. But if you look at the architecture, not only is there, are, there is a kind of um, hollow, uh, hollow architectural element behind these flowers, which would correspond very well with the kind of um, the architectural decoration of a room, but you'll also notice that the base for this terracotta vase is extremely, um, has a, uh, uh, the, the vanishing point is very far below this picture itself. And the weird thing about this painting, which puzzled me for a long time, is the fact that it has this uh, bird's nest um, apparently just floating in the front of the picture. But if you imagine this painting placed above a door, then the real architrave of the door would in fact have covered the first uh, few inches of this picture and the bird's nest would look as if it was nestling on top of the door and would suddenly make sense, whereas in its present arrangement today in the National Gallery it just looks like a complete absurdity. And the same applies, in fact, to the fruit dangling to the other side. You can't understand how it's supported. So it sometimes um, does uh, actually something for the artist's reputation to know quite where these pictures were intended to be placed. Um, a common type of picture that one finds described in inventories above doors are pictures of musicians. And this may have been because in grand rooms, musicians often performed from galleries or high up in the rooms themselves. This is a painting which in the 17th century was regarded as one of Titian's greatest pictures and uh, one of the most valuable of his works in... It, it, it hadn't... It's, been no doubt, it's no doubt been damaged by restoration, but it's still hard to believe it is by Titian. But it was believed to be by Titian both by the Gonzagas, who owned it in Mantua, and also by Charles I, who owned it in London. And it was certainly placed in Mantua above a doorway. And I think the kind of, uh, this kind of subject you find also in fresco painting, here's an example by Veronese, at quite um, this sort of part of a room. Now, this is right above a chimney rather than above a door. This picture also is first recorded as an overdoor by Valentin de Boulogne. And I think it's um, often the case that, this is a, uh, that allegories, um, especially when they're combined with music, were, pa were painted for that particular position. Hard to prove in this case, though. That was certainly the case. It was just shown that way in the 18th century. So back to the Palais Royal, and Oppenor was forced to accommodate the great collection formed by the Queen of Sweden into the collection of the Regent. It took over 10 years to negotiate this great purchase. But it included the Veronese allegories, which we know, which we feel sure were made, for, there are four of them, four ceilings. He was obliged to accommodate those, and 
arrange them as overdoors, for a room with four doors, and um, not only that, but he had to keep them in the shape that they were, although it would have certainly been his inclination to um, cut them up into fancy Rococo shapes. Um, but this collection um, even congratulated itself on not doing that, even though that great princess who'd formerly owned these pictures didn't hesitate to adapt their shape to the architectural arrangements. So poor Oppenauer's architecture was severely um, put to the severe test of having to accommodate rectangles. I find them most surprising. That they would have been arranged, I think, with the pictures leaning into the room, so they wouldn't have been so different um, in arrangement to uh, their position originally on a ceiling. But this picture, it's most alarming to discover that this painting, first recorded for certain in the 1640s, um, hung above quite a high door in the sacristy of the Escurial. It was a, it's a painting by Titian, almost certainly came from the Aldebrandini collection and previously from Ferrara, where one likes to think that it had been shown where people could contemplate it as, from as close a quarter, almost, as uh, Catherine, St. Catherine, if it is St. Catherine, the saint anyway on her knees, contemplates the beautiful baby Christ. Um, because this, is a, this, this particular part of the picture, the, the, the tender expression and the beautiful painting of these heads is much the, the finest thing in this actually what is rather an uncertain composition by, by Titian. But this great picture was placed above a door, above quite a large and high door, and more disturbing still, the person responsible for putting it there was none other than Velasquez, who was the um, uh, principal um, decorator um, and arranger of pictures for the Spanish crown. Well, of course, he may not have had much choice. We, in fact, associate this position, the position of an overdoor, as a good way of forgetting that a picture exists. And that can sometimes be shown to be exactly what happened. This very famous painting, once very famous painting by Le Sueur, of the, um, uh, of the sick Alexander taking medicine, hung in the Palais Royal as, an, as a chimney piece painting in a room full of poussins. But after having been acquired by Lady Lucas at the Orléans sale at the end of the 18th century, it was then accommodated in the middle of the 19th century as an overdoor painting in their London townhouse. And there was forgotten for, uh, oh, for a century and a half until it was recognized by Alistair Lang. And it's interesting to think how many art historians went into the room and didn't look up to see a picture in this position was regarded merely as a fixture. But this is not the way that people looked at overdoors in most of the period covered by this lecture. Now I move on to larger historical pictures and how they were arranged in rooms. And I'm showing you uh, one of the most famous 15th century chapels in Florence, decorated by Ghirlandaio, just to show you how packed these chapel spaces were with episode after episode, often one on top of one another. And when we get to documented interiors with large narrative paintings in them of a, <coughs> of a secular kind, in palace interiors in the first decade of the 16th century, we find good evidence that they were arranged in the same way. So this picture by Pinturicchio and its companion by Signorelli were painted right to be hung, were, were, were frescoes, but they were right next to one another, and we know that they had uh, just, were just separated by um, uh, beautifully carved uh, pilasters. And actually, the same arrangement, or something very similar, must have been found also in the famous little room of alabaster in uh, the castle, or between the um, and right next to the castle in, in Ferrara, for which Titian painted Bacchus and Ariadne, and for which Bellini painted his Feast of the Gods, and Titian two other paintings. We know from the continuity of the landscapes as well as from the size of the rooms. These were painted in small rooms, and the pictures were right next to one another, and they seem never to have taken into account in their uh, shape either the chimney or 
um, or the doors or the windows. It was just painted to fit in as well as they could as rectangles. When we get to the 18th century and we attend to the arrangements that I've already mentioned, the far greater emphasis on windows, especially in northern Europe, and the far greater abundance of mirrors, um, and the development of shaped overdoors, you find this type of picture scattered throughout a room with mirrors making the room seem larger between them, and sometimes with one format and sometimes another. So you can see the painted elements around this great music room in Sanssouci. It's painted by Gertner in the middle of the 19th century, but faithful to its 18th century character. You'll see how the painted elements um, are, appear in two formats and broken by these other elements. Now, by now, of course, the, that extraordinary revolution in taste, which meant that everything that should be rectangular has become curved, so that not only chair le um, table legs, as here, but also drawers, um, as, as you can also see, um, have been shaped so that they flow into one another. This way of thinking, this is a very beautiful drawing by Oppenor um, in the Cooper Hewitt collection, this way of thinking has enabled people also to unite the paintings with the decoration of a room in a completely new way. These paintings filling large panels, so panels so conveniently demonstrated in this room, as you can see, all covered not with paintings, alas, but with fabric, um, didn't necessarily, weren't necessarily painted, of course, with narratives. They could be also painted with buffet, as in this great picture by Desportes. And this was originally a shaped painting, by the way, like the ones which you see flowing around this room. Um, and if you look carefully at it, you can see that the corners have been added. They were originally cut away, and they're no doubt um, it was more elaborate, um, very elaborate in its original framing and size. But what about the chief position in the room, the chimney piece? Um, again and again, we find in the 18th century that this is actually a looking glass. Clearly not in this case, or at least that could perhaps explain why the man is so astonished. It, he thought that it was a looking glass. Um, and there is a very interesting tension in 18th century design all over Europe between uh, the looking glass and the picture. In uh, northern Italy, um, in Savoy, you very often find portraits actually hung on top of looking glasses so that uh, people... Um, could presumably admire themselves um, and themselves, or themselves and their ancestors simultaneously. And you do find designs. This is one of my very few original contributions to those um, scholarly cards uh, which I was shown in the Cooper Hewitt print room. This design by Oppenor, I believe, is for a looking glass with a painting above it. So it's a painted frame. He's given you variations, of course. Uh, the only way it's got this by the, it follows the convention of a very pale blue wash, which would have been um, glass. So it's a, it's a double, it's an answer to this particular question. Now, sometimes the painted elements in a room would be very tall, narrow in uh, formats. In this particular case, which is a drawing by one of the Crace family for the decorations of the quite deplorable um, pavilion uh, created for King George IV at Brighton. Um, the format of these Orientalist pictures is clearly being determined by some knowledge of um, Oriental scrolls. But actually, these divisions between peers, as in this other design from the same workshop, could be quite um, narrow. Um, they could sometimes be supplied, actually, by... Um, um, silk or paper painted with exotic subjects in China. But there were plenty of European artists uh, like this one able to supply uh, decorative pictures of this kind that would have been shown around a room. And I think they sometimes, I feel they should be called um, pier pictures after the way that pier glasses are so described. Because I think the, one of the things that chiefly determines this format is the space between the windows in a room. Um, though that not always so. And this is a paint, painting of a landscape of, which, of, this, of this panel format, again, that painted on canvas, and indoor direct by an artist who imitated the style of Kaup at a time when every single Kaup indoor direct was being bought by the English. 
It's true, for example, of some of the most interesting pictures we have by Tiepolo in the National Gallery. They are of this very tall, narrow format. Sometimes something interesting seems to be going on in them, as in the one on the right here. But more likely, they are merely choral figures, beautifully arranged, and this slicing up of a narrative into narrow formats of this kind enabled the artist to produce uh, genre scenes, virtually, sometimes of very, very great beauty, as with this arrangement of figures which have absolutely no story to tell at all. And the most interesting paintings of this kind in the, are on loan to the National Gallery and are these remarkable, remarkably large pictures by Corro, painted for a friend of his in the 1850s, and they were painted for a room where there were landscapes of the different times of day with windows between them, ending, of course, with a starlit sky. And the convention remains an important one right into the early years of the 20th century with these two Renoir painted to go beside a chimney piece, but obviously also, I think, painted to go beside a mirror above a chimney piece for a house in Paris. So we come now to the end of my talk and the problem of how do you give special emphasis to one particular picture in a room? And here is the most obvious way of doing it. You have it above a chimney, um, and you actually tilt it forward for easier viewing because it's so high. And that is a position for which, uh, in which Rubens's great early painting of Samson and Delilah was originally to be seen, as you can see from this painting, which incidentally also includes a sculptural overdoor, a painted overdoor, and many landscapes acting as a kind of frieze around the room. But the great picture in this room, the room, and indeed it seems to have been designed to accommodate this great picture, was placed above the chimney and probably also slightly tilted forward. Uh, this remains uh, the place for a great family picture in the 18th and early 19th century in English houses. And you can